Um, so I'm going to begin my presentation. We only have an hour, and I just like to set up the context to make sure that you're all prepared. So it's going to be an introduction, a flight by. You can envision yourself to be on an airplane 30,000 feet up in the air. Um, I will make sharp turns throughout the presentation because I'd like to explain some of the constructs that uh, IBM Watson brand and cognitive computing strategy encompasses in itself. And um, as a first step, even before I get to my personal introduction, I'd like to practice what I learned in a class and identify dependent and inter interdependent variables. So I notice uh, by name tags, there is a financial services sector. Can you raise your hand who is in financial services? I notice consumer product goods, retail. Uh, there is Villanova faculty. Uh, whom did I miss? Healthcare, very good. So I touch on, on most of those areas which, are, which represent vertical industry segments in my presentation. That's why I did the poll of the audience. So let's get started and another disclaimer. Uh, because we only have an hour, uh, again, the subject is very broad and I wanna dive deep in some of the areas. It is unlikely that we'll be able to finish everything. And if you're interested in any other individual areas, you feel free to reach to me or I'll put you in touch with the right uh, IBM um, representative to do a deep dive. Each individual area that we're going to touch on is probably subject that worth 90 minutes to two hour conversation and by itself. And again, I just compress it all to share with you what a Watson brand and cognitive computing strategy is all about. <clears throat> so uh, I have three different roles. My day job is uh, I work for IBM. I've been with IBM for a very long time. I will comment on my title in a second. Um, I do various things at IBM. Uh, specifically, I align all of the IBM capabilities, including cognitive, with all of the client uh, needs, the client that I work with. I also volunteer as IBM or on campus at Villanova, and I'll speak in a second what that means. And uh, I also work with nonprofit organizations and uh, uh, executive groups in Philadelphia area to determine how new technologies like cognitive will fit and transform different industries. So this is a brief agenda uh, that we're going to step through. Uh, the subject of data science and advanced analytics is going to be important to us. I will share with you a brief story of a different IBM moonshot projects. So Watson is one of many, many IBM moonshot projects. I will describe what uh, IBM Watson uh, brand is about. And as we go through the presentation, uh, I'll show or share with you uh, different uh, use cases where uh, IBM cognitive capabilities fit and can support. I have uh, a numerous videos and uh, short, very short videos, and uh, some of the uh, web manipulations embedded in my presentation. We're not going to be doing any programming today, but some of the areas that we will discuss uh, will require and are supported by composable business applications. So this is just another disclaimer. I will stop probably five to 10 minutes before uh, the time that my time slot ends and I'll let you ask any question. I welcome your questions throughout the presentation. Just please be cognizant of time, very short time that we have. So that brings us to that funky title that I invented for myself. And the subject of data science is, um, continues to be a very interesting, exciting, uh, and highly disputed area, which is what the data science is. For me, it all started, um, in, in around 2010, 2011, before my current client, I used to work in public sector, local government. My client was the city of New York. The city of New York is a large enterprise, uh, and uh, I was there right at the time when Mayor Bloomberg was trying to run the city by numbers. So we had a lot of projects across all of the different uh, industry verticals that comprise and support city, and uh, I work, uh, led a lot of uh, data analytics, architecture, system integration, system transformation projects at the city of New York. As I was doing it, I found the phenomenon. The phenomenon was that um, a lot of folks that I worked with and we had a very strong team, I noticed that they started to change the jobs. One of the best friends that I had who published the book and is an incredible information and data scientist himself, 
I saw his, him changing his title from information forensic to data pathologist. So I decided to follow the suit, and that's how the title Data Enchanter and Information <laughs> Virtuosa came to be. And it wasn't really my, my idea. I was getting feedback from the team that I led. You know, Boris, how do you connect different dots? How do you lead our projects? So that's how the title came to be. Uh, so that brings up the question, which is, I think, very important question and very important element of cognitive science and uh, advanced analytics, which is, how does one become a data scientist? So in 2010, 2011, it was very easy. I took my credit card, sorry, business card, and I just changed my title to data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> As I was thinking about it, um, and the information comes from Wikipedia, it's an open source, and it is Wikipedia that states that you know, data science may or may not be a real discipline, but in my mind, uh, this is what comprises the data sciences. So there, there are actually two different areas which are highly complementary, and there is that very important intersect between these areas, which is data science and information science. And throughout my career, I practice a little bit on both sides. Um, there is another discipline which is, uh, was well practiced, well developed at IBM, and also outside of the IBM, are called knowledge management, which is also profiled on Wikipedia. And it intersects and leans more toward information science. And then as far as the day jobs, IBM was well structured and defined multiple disciplines such as architects, specialists, scientists. Uh, there was even and continues to be a design thinking discipline that rapidly emerging at IBM today. So all that kind of uh, crystallized for me when I had opportunity to attend Gartner Enterprise Architecture Summit. I hope everyone is familiar with Gartner Research. Yes. Um, so Gartner runs industry research and conducts multiple conferences. So I had the opportunity to attend with uh, my client, Gartner Enterprise Architecture Summit in 2014. And gentleman by the name Gareth Herschel, who leads Gartner business analytics uh, practice within uh, Gartner, presented this model. Uh, he calls the specialty analytics leader. And in Gareth's view, this is where data scientists would fit in and belong to. So as I was reviewing this slide, I actually took my thinking to uh, another level. And uh, that was prompted by another project. So IBM has a think tank. Actually, IBM has several think tanks. One of the think tanks is IBM Academy of Technology that runs multiple research projects. And that, that particular research project that I participated in was about identifying the disruptive business patterns or what areas and how these disruptive business patterns could possibly emerge. So combining um, Gareth thinking with mine, that's what the model came to be. And this is how I view uh, data science today. So briefly explaining uh, this slide. Um, so there is that intersection of data science, information science, and someone invented that acronym, and IBM likes acronyms. So IOA actually stands for information-oriented architecture. So when you face any particular business problem, you can ta tackle it from different sides, different perspectives, different sides. One of the perspectives that you can tackle any business problem is information, data, and advanced analytics. And there is a semi-formal definition of information-oriented architecture, and IBM develop it and uh, release it to the world, IBM vision and view of what information architecture is. So if you look at these uh, dark blue uh, areas, in my view, when you combine system and design thinking with data science and information science and apply um, well-defined architecture, th system thinking-driven approach, that's where disruptive business patterns would emerge to, from. So that's how I view uh, data science. And again, the uh, debate and dialogue continues what exactly data science is. To help and solve the dialogue, uh, IBM actually brings our own point of view to different universities. So IBM has well-structured program uh, called IBM Academic Initiative, and I'm here I volunteer, I speak to you not as much as IBM or as I, IBM volunteer, as part of uh, one of the components of this program uh, called IBM or on campus, which is part of the larger uh, IBM academic initiative program. 
This is just a sample of some of the worldwide universities that IBM is engaged in. There is 150, now probably 200 worldwide universities where IBM is engaged in. And one of the activities that we lead is to figure out, define, and introduce curriculum of what data science is. And in a sense, we define discipline as we work with multiple academic institutions. Okay? We'll take another step uh, in a direction of data science. So I have a couple of slides where uh, I summarize uh, what uh, the data analytics and uh, related solutions are and what are the workloads that this solution support. Uh, when we had the previous probably two round tables before this one, a gentleman from SAP was sharing SAP HANA, which happens to be uh, in-memory uh, analytics workload. So uh, it's very, it's related to and often supports enterprise data warehouse, which is uh, the model of data ocean and data lakes that IBM define and industry embrace in general. So as we progress through the list, and I'm not going to go through the entire slide, uh, single domain line of business analytics, particularly uh, uh, descriptive business intelligence or reporting is well adopted across multiple different industries. Again, it's supported by workloads or it implemented as in database analytics or analytics on hybrid cloud. Um, single domain uh, predictive analytics, uh, analytics of private, public, or cross-enterprise data. One of the projects that I ran uh, while I was working with the city of New York is uh, New York City um, developed and released an open data initiative by which all of the city agencies uh, collected and released to the public uh, the data that describes the operation of the city. And the city of New York conducted uh, hackathons and application contexts by which uh, private entities were encouraged to uh, participate in competition and build the application based on that open data. Interestingly enough, Philadelphia also has an open data initiative, which uh, presents an incredible opportunity to apply advanced analytics and data science to derive a unique insight from that vast, um, uh, vast uh, volumes of data. An interesting question, uh, which um, has different point of view, is prescriptive analytics. And prescriptive analytics, I'd like to keep, I'd like for you to keep that point in mind as we go through cognitive. Would any of you really trust a prescriptive recommendation made, by, made or delivered to you by a computer, by a machine? So it's an interesting point to contemplate. And the list continues. Uh, we have capabilities where we can analyze uh, data in motion. So data does not have to be in rest. Uh, it's called stream analytics. One of the implementations of stream analytics was uh, New York City has a lower Manhattan security initiative called LMSI, where <clears throat> you can actually get to the console and ask the system where red pickup truck with this particular license place was last seen. And the system will show you the location of where that occurrence took place. Um, IBM continues, I'm not going to speak about big data, it's again the science by itself. Uh, IBM has other very advanced and interesting projects uh, that requires uh, attention and study. One of these projects is uh, Graph and Gra Graph DB. Uh, in a typical IBM non-obvious sense, it's called IBM System G. Uh, that particular project is in the last phases of becoming commercialized. And I have one question for you. What it is the, la what it is the most uh, prevalent and popular graph database that all of us use on a daily basis? Internet. All of the web pages are linked in a graph-like fashion. And you're welcome to take a look at the URL. There are very cool um, visualizations and applications of um, of these capabilities. Uh, the interesting concept, which is going to take us one step further toward Watson and cognitive, is uh, what is called object-based, no metadata analytics. Um, so what it is, is data, any kind of data, 
is typically described by the metadata. So the metadata is the color, the actual data values is green, blue, yellow, et cetera. In some circumstances, um, the analytics can be performed without any metadata. So let's try and see how, let's try and see how it would work. So this is a set of images. This particular um, capability is powered by Watson. And there is a set of pictures presented. So if we select a particular picture, the image will get classified. There are a couple of things I wanted to highlight to you as part of that classification. It does not contain a single, a, a single answer. It contains several classes with probabilities being assigned to each individual class. And also, there is that yes or no question. Did we get it right or not? So the picture was a picture of the person. It's not required, but that's how system learns if we acknowledge it, that yes, it is a person. Next time when the image is presented, the learning accumulated as part of this interaction will get applied to subsequent image analysis. Then the face is getting analyzed. And age is determined. So interestingly enough, the gender has high degree of probability. The age is not so much. Um, and similarly enough, uh, the celebrity match is also established with fairly high degree of probability and will help system confirm that this is the right match. So this is a live API and uh, because we have such a short period of time and such a big agenda, I will only do one other um, image comparison to share with you a point, but if you find any web URL that has JPG extension in it that actually carries the image. You can analyze your own picture, you can analyze objects. And I tested it on myself, I tested it on my car. The results are quite amazing. So before we go any further, uh, I'd like to try this one because it delivers some other interesting lesson. So the analysis is dynamic. Correct, so nothing is uh, static in this model. So it's determined system. Watson visual recognition determined that this is a sign, high degree of probability. And then, interestingly enough, uh, object char character recognition is executed to define what that sign actually means with, again, very high degree of probability. So what this is, and I'll share with you further in presentation how it fits in the overall model. This is actually an API, application programming interface. This particular box can be programmed and accessed from any type of application. I'd like to con contrast this with um, Google search. I will keep it. So Google has similar interface. So if we search for a car, okay, let's make it interesting. Like, let's search for racing car, or race car. So this is what Google returns. Uh, it returns based on the behavior and some testing that I did. Uh, so what would be of interest to us is take a look at the images. And you can see clearly the difference in how Google executes the search versus how Watson is processing image recognition. So Google classifies the images, but it does not necessarily dive in and perform detailed image analysis. 
So the reason it's important is because of uh, this particular announcement. that IBM recently made. Let's see, okay. operator. So the same image recognition will get applied to medical images. So IBM recently acquired a company called Merge Healthcare that runs a medical imaging management platform. And the same type of capability that was previously applied will get further fine-tuned and enhanced to process medical images, MRIs, X-rays, to determine abnormalities and look for any possible diseases. And again, it's all going to continue to be based on system capability to learn. So this is a last scientific slide um, that uh, I wanted to share with you, and then we get into uh, more interesting areas of uh, Watson. But this is one of the business challenges, if you will, or the business challenge at large, that uh, Cognitive and Watson are targeted to solve. So I had the opportunity and privilege to attend yet another Gartner event with my client in 2013. And the focus of that particular um, Gartner IT Expo was um, the context, the scope, and the meaning of the fourth industrial revolution, which, uh, will, which is driven and is based on confluence of multiple forces that we're well familiar with. And as I continue to work uh, with my current clients, I realized that uh, one of the artifacts of this uh, transformation or disruptions of global digital industrial economy is the fact that uh, many capabilities will get virtualized. They're going to be brought by structural changes, increased volatility that will require different way of thinking about it. And what IBM Watson brand and Cognitive will help us do is to apply our thinking through computer, human to computer interactions to deal with this vulnerability and uncertainty that fourth industrial revolution brought for us to face. Uh, from a business to IT alignment perspective, uh, which is the space that I work in, uh, in the past, um, the situation was complex, but it was uh, manageable. IT was here. It, the idea was to figure out what's the best way of aligning IT capability with business. And that alignment was facilitated by systems, which were on a boundary between business and IT, and everything was well structured. This particular demand and this particular artifacts of global digital uh, industrial economy combined with, with vulnerability and uncertainty, created this type of picture where business has a capability to go and acquire many uh, solutions that it needs to support business functions, and IT have to catch up and figure out how to deal with it, particularly if these capabilities are delivered from outside of the enterprise, not from within the enterprise. So business to IT alignment in my daily job moved to that you know, highly complex, highly volatile, highly, highly political area where business and IT actually overlap. So from IBM perspective, yet another think tank that exists within IBM is uh, IBM Institute for Business Value called IBV. And uh, IBV published the following summary, basically facilitating and confirming that all of this volatility and uncertainty can benefit from applying cognitive advanced analytics capabilities powered by Watson brand. Um, this is an image. Uh, you can check the URL, download whatever paper, whatever point of view, which is applicable to your particular industry. I do have access, and I believe that these particular papers that are shown on um, screenshot 
are available. So if you have interest in each particular area, just reach to me and I'll get you a paper if you cannot find it. This is all public information. So that's in a nutshell what drives IBM, Watson, and Cognitive. So that takes us to um, another question that I get often from my client and question that we continue and um, debate with an IBM, which is, what is the difference between business analytics and cognitive? Is it all the same? So I'd like to answer this, this particular question, leveraging the huge success that Villanova University had last year. So like everyone else, thousands of students and faculty were watching the baseball game. And uh, some of the uh, sport agencies were tracking stats from this game. So I'd like to take another trip to, uh, yeah, that's not going to work, but uh, I'd like to take another trip to the website. ESPN was re really bad. This web website, NCA website, is actually was much better. So it actually presented analytics in a very usable and interesting form. So this is the shot chart. Uh, it's not very interactive. I don't know who took that particular shot. But as far as the summary, they have that uh, tab-like view which I will try and navigate to. And that one is much more interesting. So there is more interaction here. You remember that human to computer interaction is important. And it presents a reliable way of information, which is what is what and uh, you know, different statistics of the game. Um, so if we take this and take it to another level, and again, these screenshots represent, you know, the point in time where a game was taking place. NCAA website, luckily, uh, still keeps it in place. So this is another view, powered of Watson, and this view is uh, today's view of how Vill Villanova Wildcats relate to North Carolina. So let me take another moment. Find my cursor here. And see if we can run, run it live. So we say, you know, Wildcats is organization. We're going to add another search. We're going to say North Carolina. We're going to see what it will come back with, which should be the image similar to the image that we just saw. Uh, and we'll see how we can interact with this image. And I misspell not North Carolina. <laughs> so we'll investigate it again. So as it's acquiring information, this is an example of um, another API. It's a real-time news feed analysis. And again, I'll help you understand in a second um, how it all fits in a broader uh, context of Watson brand and cognitive analytics. So as you can see, the information is pulled in real time. There is a system bug. I'm not sure why is it related to baseball not basketball. In the image that we saw, it was the system determined. I guess there was some news in the news feeds related to um, basketball. But as far as the interactions, 
as you can see, this particular an an analytics, the way it's constructed, it's all live. And I can easily filter out. I can remove companies and organizations. And I, ha and I have a re real time instant map of how people, human, between uh, different teams are related to each other. So all this is highly interactive and you can, you know, compare and contrast how this analytics reported by NCAA would relate to cognitive powered, news powered uh, capabilities delivered by this particular API. Um, I do not have details. Uh, we'll, we'll get to news feeds. Uh, we'll, we'll get to social feeds in a second. Um, it, it's not presented here. This is a highly abbreviated version of what the API is capable of. Overall, it is capable of processing social media feeds. And there is a, and, and there's an example for the in, presenta in presentation where it shows that. So similarly, and that's what... Um, That's what uh, I wanted to show um, while we are here. If anyone has a question of what like your company or IBM does today, that question can be easily answered based on the information that's available about a particular company. So today, IBM is a company is highly focusing on cloud computing, which we'll speak in a second. Um, in the healthcare, there was some announcement in uh, area of healthcare, life sciences, and genetics. We have active partnership with Apple. We actually resell Apple hardware now, so that's why that Mac OS is here, including iPhones and a lot of gear. We're still working on data analytics, we acquired weather company, and all of the related news feeds can be accessed to derive additional information. The same can be applied to your enterprise, and again, the URL is in my presentation. It's an example of uh, an API, so we can run it on Villanova, you can run it on your own companies, any company that you have interest in. So this is an example of just one of many APIs. Um, we're going to go to our next slide. I hope. You can actually convert this into a search product by Google. It, it, it's not our uh, objective to do that. Our objective is to differentiate ourselves from other suppliers. So it is an API, and like any other API, you can do multiple things with it. Uh, we are not positioning ourselves as a search engine. We are positioning ourselves as a flexible cognitive platform. And I'll explain in a second what it means. So one of the first vertical solutions that we'll take a look at is Watson Sport. There will be one minute clip. And then I'll comment on it in a second. It's just way too cool. Serena Williams. Hey, Watson. You are a fierce competitor. I've heard that. I have analyzed your biggest matches. Oh, really? Swim down a point. You serve an ace 5.8 times more than other top players. You sound like a coach. I am not, but I can customize training programs based on biomarker data. Watson, that's pretty impressive. You might say I am the Serena Williams of cloud-based cognitive systems. So this is rapidly emerging area, and these are, at the bottom, some of the solutions that we are delivering in this space. Uh, so the reason for Serena Williams' interview is that IBM technology for a long time powered uh, US Open and other tennis matches. So we had accumulated substantial amount of data to come up with a 
recommendations that system shared with Serena Villain. So we're going to keep moving along. Uh, we have another 20 minutes left. As soon as I find my cursor. Before you go there, I have a quick question. Okay, go ahead. Um, you just recently purchased uh, weather.com for three days of our, three days of our IBM just purchased that. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the um, anticipate use for that data set and or why, why do you buy? Why okay. do you buy? So, so there are multiple implications to weather data, uh, and I'll highlight three, and it will be difficult for me to cover everything. Um, so as I was working with uh, New York City, New York City Police Department, and other public safety agencies, there is a very strong correlation between crime and weather. So uh, I believe a police department in Minneapolis uh, was exploring and mapping their crime stats and correlating it with data. And when the data gets bad, apparently that's where the crime spikes come up and that will help police department to de properly deploy the forces. That's one example. The second example, it was mentioned at um, one of the conferences where uh, weather.com, uh, by, by the way, weather.com, our CEO is now a general manager of Watson Brand, just for the record. Um, so he was presenting uh, just immediately after the acquisition and one of the funny examples that he shared was IBM work with multiple consumer suppliers. Uh, Walmart is IBM customer, Costco is IBM customer, et cetera, et cetera. So w one of the funny uh, stories that they shared is, would you guess from consumer product goods perspective, if it rains outside, what are the most popular products that people buy in grocery stores? The answer is males go for a beer, women go for detergent. <sighs> and that's an actual date. <laughs> um, the other area, which is a bit more serious as far as um, weather company and IBM, is that uh, weather has substantial impact on supply chain operations, optimization, work around transportation, airline traffic. There are some applications that have been built by jointly between um, IBM and Apple. And based on the wind direction, uh, airplane needs to take a board more or less fuel that would result in substantial savings for airline company if they know what the wind direction is at different parts, particularly if the route is very long. It's one, one of few examples. Many more. There are many more, of course. Um, I have a question surrounding uh, Watson Sports. Mm -hmm. Is, I guess, the aim of that to, for, I guess, organizations to purchase that type of software in So again, I'll put a disclaimer. I'm here as an IBM volunteer, and nothing that I say should be interpreted as further looking, investment decision guiding, any other risk related areas. But I had uh, an interesting conversation. Uh, in my day job, I ride Amtrak a lot, Amtrak train between Philadelphia and New York. Uh, so I met uh, one of the IT managers who works for NHL. His immediate interest when I ran that demo for him was, and we were just sitting in a cafe car, the train was busy. Uh, his immediate reaction to me was, wouldn't it be nice to leverage it as a recruitment tool? So instead of coaches scouting colleges with notepads, you can actually record the game. You can run image analysis and streaming analytics on actual game. <coughs> you can collect the data through other APIs. You can find out who up and coming player is in any given sport. There is another capability that I will show you in a second that can actually help you decide if that player that you pick up based on his advanced characteristics in whatever sport would be a good fit or a bad fit in your existing team. So it's not A or B or C, it's A and B and C combined 
which is another value that uh, Watson and cognitive analytics bring, <coughs> which is combining data from multiple different domains. No comment. Um, so how did IBM um, arrive to Watson? IBM is known for what IBM calls moonshot projects. And I brought with me, and I'm going to leave with ICE, a book which was uh, published and issued uh, during uh, 100th anniversary of the company in 2011. This is just some of the examples of moonshot projects and how IBM as a company progressed from building food scales and meat and cheese slicers to tie keeping tabulating machine to air defense program to supporting Apollo 13 mission to still powering today. And unfortunately, I didn't make it to the session where uh, one of the gentlemen from Sabre was presenting to Center for Business Analytics. IBM transaction processing facility, which is customized mainframe system, still supports and processes airline traffic reservations even today. Deep Blue chess plane machine roadrunner was a commodity built supercomputer. Um, IBM jointly with Toshiba and Sony developed cell processor that uh, powered Sony PlayStation 3. And now we are uh, at the era of cognitive and I will leave that book at ice. So I mentioned several times that um, IBM Watson is a brand and um, there are capabilities that solutions that are aggregated in this brand. And this is, a, in my view, very interesting summary of what we discuss, which are what the differentiators are for these solutions. So it's a personalized interaction that we saw in previous examples and we're going to get even further into the personalization space. It's scalability. Uh, you saw that the response from um, Watson News Explorer was reasonable. And again, this is an open API that exposed to everyone on the planet, essentially. Ubiquity, ability to sense. Um, the sensing capabilities, I have a video. There is a particular capabilities related to sensing that we're going to review in a second. And obviously, system learns. So when system learns, there are a particular disclaimer or particular point that I wanted to share and highlight with you. System can learn in two different ways. It can learn by ingesting the information. But as you saw from our previous interactions, and uh, it also was quite visible in original um, Watson Jeopardy game that I'll speak about in a second. Um, system requires human interactions to determine how these probabilities uh, fit in the real world and what the ultimate level of truth is. So um, it's important to differentiate IBM Watson brand and IBM Watson journey that we rapidly progressing through today from Watson Jeopardy version one. I'll call it version one. So I searched hard and I finally found this particular PDF file. You can still download it if you're interested. Um, this IBM uh, system journal details step-by-step, step, component by component, what IBM Watson Jeopardy system was, which was much different from the uh, capabilities that we're going to be reviewing in a second. Um, so it's powered by, um, it responds to demand of the cognitive business. It's driven by advanced analytics. Uh, there is a set of examples that I will step through as time permits. Um, if we do not get to any of these uh, examples, we can do it as a you know, deep dive subsequent session if there is a particular interest in these areas. So the important point on this slide, you, you have to differentiate Watson Jeopardy, which is described in this PDF document that you can download, from any of the other Watson solutions and Watson capabilities that we're going to discuss or we have discussed already. So after the Jeopardy game, the first thing that came to be industry-oriented is 
Watson chef. So we'll see if we can invent our own cuisine. Um, I like this punchline. Let's get cooking. I'm not a gourmet cook, so you, you got to recognize that. I am a data enchanter and inform, information <laughs> determiner. OK, so I know nothing about cooking. And it's all about interaction. So let's choose a dish. And being a developer in the past, I'm very simple. I pick up the first one. So this is what the dish is. We can decide if we want to include garlic in a dish. And based on volume of information collected in the system, Watson chef acknowledges that, yes, fresca can come with garlic. Can we try and add apple juice? It's also possible. Interestingly enough, if we pick up that, there is an ingredient, an instruction how to make it. So basically what Watson does, and this is more than just simple analytics play. Um, it matches the ingredients with human experience and determines if this, if, 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 if this match would work or not. Uh, I'll see if I can pick up something that is not a good fit. Yeah, it, it, everything here, but you, 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 see, you see the point, so let, let's see if we can exclude tomato juice, what will happen. We can still make fresco. Okay, I don't know, I need to find out. Um, the answer can be found in this URL. So because it's been branded as IBM Chef Watson, it probably contained within a particular vertical within Watson brand. Um, I, I need to explore, I need to see what the status is. It's not, it's not an API. I don't think it's, it's an API, but obviously API can be developed. So if you're interested, I can help you find out who owns it within IBM. And it's one of the first applications that was developed. It actually can suggest the receipt. I mean, under the different set of circumstances, it can actually build a dish for you. There is an opposite query that we don't have time for, where you pick up the ingredients and you ask, cook me a dish, and it'll tell you what the dish combinations are. Um, so the more current um, foray of cognitive was this. Watson and fashion. Uh, I will not play the full movie because we're running out of time, but uh, I'll play at least one minute of it. When you were young and you would imagine a dress that would do things that were a little otherworldly, you know, the idea that fabrics could change color or that lights can come on. It has this magical component. Now this is possible. We were approached by IBM and we heard about Watson and Watson's capabilities. It just really excited us on a creative level, thinking, my God, what are the possibilities here? Watson learns like humans do, through senses, experiences, and new iterations of what it's done. Watson can look at text, video data, images, taking what the fans are saying in text about the dress, and it's understanding the emotions underneath. We had an idea about the dress. We had multiple criteria for Watson, like fabric and the weight and how it cuts, and based on all these parameters, Watson made a few suggestions. It's not a case that we're very hands-on here, so it may be about finding a material that could be like a silk or an agamba, then it's trying to work out what you're going to do with it, how you're going to make Across any project we take on with Watson, it is a partnership between man and machine, with the 
Marquesa project, while Watson came in and made a lot of assistive recommendations, ultimately it was Marquesa designers who were making the key decisions about the dress. We really felt that Watson just enabled us to do our job better. We said... Okay, I'm going to keep moving with my presentation. I'll leave slides. You have URLs. You can watch it. You can find it. It's all available. Um, so I'd like to summarize and share with you how it all fits together because it will be one of the biggest questions that you have. So this is not IBM. This is my way of thinking. Um, these are the building blocks of Watson. It's not an official architecture. But I, will, I would like to take a couple of minutes and just guide you through it. So we look at vertical solutions that we had some examples of. Um, these solutions are based on a platform, which is a cloud-based platform that supports those APIs that we saw and additional APIs that we're going to see. So these are all Watson solutions. We encourage vendors uh, you had question about cooking, to build an ecosystem. So Watson Chef is a part of the ecosystem, and there are vendors that try to apply the same capability to wine mixing, for example. There are other Watson applications that have been built by multiple companies. I will speak in a second about Watson APIs. There are other Watson brand components that are already installed at Villanova. Doctor Laboratory tested piloted as part of the online MBA program that Tom mentioned, Watson Explorer and Watson Content Analytics. And I want to thank Scott, who was here a second ago, uh, Scott Hansen, who helped us in install it at uh, Villanova School of Business. Watson Analytics is an analytics component that we deliver off the cloud. And Tom and I in discussion, you know, how we can leverage as part of Watson Analytics as part of his curriculum. It doesn't require any installation. It's a pretty powerful tool performing various data analysis. So I'd like to spend a moment before I run out of time to take a look at this platform. Uh, I have it open. So the platform looks like this. So it's a cloud-based platform. You can provision hardware or storage needed for you to build and run applications. You can build applications for web deployment or mobile deployment that I'm not going to go into. These are the capabilities that uh, are available for advanced analytics. You can provision and instantiate program Apache Spark you have uh, an opportunity to do big data analysis, you leveraging R and other capabilities. You can work with cloud and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can build geospatial analysis. So all these are APIs that can be rapidly wired in an ad hoc fashion and deployed into a scalable fashion to become applications. Uh, not going to go into the storage because we're short of time. There is another thing I wanted to show you, but these are the cognitive APIs. So Alchemy API is that news API that we saw. So that's how it looks in the environment of Bluemix. Concept Insight, I don't have a demo for. The dialogue we're going to see in a second. Uh, document conversion, language translation, natural language classifier, we're going to see demo in a second. Personality Insight, if I have two more minutes, I can show you. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Overall, overall, we have this set of capabilities. So Bluemix is rapidly evolving. I'm going to skip this slide. Overall, these are all of the different APIs that are available on the platform that you can access, um, combine to build whatever applications or solutions that are needed to support your business challenges. Once some of these APIs are combined together, these are the solutions that you're going to end up with. This is a financial services bank demo. Hi, Pepper. Okay, 
So, could you introduce yourself? My name is Pepper. I'm a completely new species of social humanoid robot, designed by SoftBank Robotics. Okay. So, could you tell us how have you been? It's been a big year for me. I'm working in all sorts of companies, like banks, retail stores, and hotels, to help customers have the best possible experience. I've been thinking about giving homes in Japan. Okay. So you've been very busy. What else? Now that I'm using Watson, I am learning a lot. I can read up to 800 million pages a second and can better understand human and natural language. Sometimes it's tricky for me to understand phrases that don't translate word for word. Throwing shade, for example, has nothing to do with the sun. Who would have thought? <laughs> okay, very impressive. See what I did? I was able to recognize your tone and understand that you're excited, so I responded enthusiastically. <laughs> yes, that's a very important point. I want to help give customers the best possible experience. I'm also learning the language of various industries. To work in a bank, for example, I have to become an expert in banking systems. For instance, there are three main types of mortgages. Fixed rate, adjustable rate, and interest only mortgages. Okay, so what should I consider for an interest only mortgage? Because your monthly payment would only repay the interest accruing on your mortgage. The only equity you would have on your home would be the amount you paid for a down payment. Hmm, that's helpful. But wait, there's more. You would not build equity unless the market value of your home were to go up. If the market value of your home were to decline, then you could lose part or all of your down payment. Oh, that sounds very serious. I know. Bummer. So I'm going to stop it here. Uh, you, you get a sense of what it is. So how it's all done um, in practical fashion is by combining multiple APIs that assess intent, entity, context, which was a banking context in this particular presentation, and intonations of the human voice. Um, other um, example that will run, and that will unfortunately be the last one because we're running out of time, is um, similar capabilities because I know there are a couple of investment firms here, financial services firms. So this is how uh, it can look uh, from an application perspective in investment context. And as you know, when you invest money, it's very emotionally charged uh, type of activity. So we have clients and we have representatives and their personalities are being assessed by the system. I'll show you in a second how it's done. And if we select any particular person as a client, the system can tell us what uh, personality and risk tolerance of this particular person is. <laughs> and then leveraging similar insight it can match the person to appropriate funds, or it can match person to appropriate representatives, and also explain what that match is based on, what attributes, and uh, assert the percent of that match. So the actual API that does it also exists on uh, open, publicly accessible uh, web destination. And uh, as I was testing and getting ready to present, um, I ran a test on myself, which I will try and repeat today. So basically what it is, uh, the question was it can, if it can process social media. Yes, it can. Uh, you can enter your text, which unfortunately we don't have time to do today, but you can try it if you're writing. You can just paste your own text and the system will tell you, build your personality map. Or you can assess uh, 
your Twitter personality. Now, because I am logged in into Bluemix where that API lives, it knows who I am. And even though, even though I have very few tweets, like 10 or 15, it builds quite accurate profile of who I am. Unfortunately, this is all we have for today because of the time limitation. We can have a couple of minutes for the questions and hopefully we have deeper dive or you know, explore other areas in subsequent roundtables. Thank you very much.